I got to tell you, I was uh, just sitting here trying to do a, a quick video. Uh, we do a little pregame warm up before we go on the air. I do it on my Facebook page, take a couple of topics where I delve into them. And while I was doing it, an old friend that I haven't heard from in ages connected with me about 7.30 this morning on Facebook. And so I was trying to do the video and he started instant messaging me through the video. And I'm trying to concentrate because when you're doing these Facebook videos, you get all of these comments and messages from people. And I don't mind if it's a question about what I'm talking about, but it's like, hey, Bill, how you doing? Long time no see. And I, and I hope he wasn't uh, insulted when I said lights on, nobody home. <laughs> but his, his messages stopped at that point. So uh, it was just saying, hey, look, I'm in the middle of something here. I really can't uh, can't delve into that conversation right now. Good hearing from you. We'll talk later. Seven minutes after eight o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning on News Radio 1310. KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. I wanted to open up today. In fact, this is the preview from my video a few minutes ago, or it was the preview of what I'm talking about now off the top of the show today. The Daily Caller had this. I got home from work yesterday, so it was nothing I could talk about on air. I was already uh, home and with my feet propped up watching a little television, and I checked some messages, and I had an email from the Daily Caller's website. Headline, German Intelligence. We have evidence ISIS hides hit squads among Syrian refugees. Now, are you at all surprised by that? Duh. Come on, folks. We told you yesterday... That Mike Crapo, during an interview with the with the editorial board at the Times News, had said, we don't know who these people are. There's no way to vet them, in Syria especially, because all the records have been destroyed. People are just showing up at refugee camps that they can claim to be. A lot of them are simply just migrants, too, who are looking for a way to come to the, uh, to the wealthier northern world and try to get your job. But some of them could well be dangerous. I know that liberals don't like it when politicians say things like that because they think that we should risk our our lives and our families so that they can feel better about patting themselves on the back as they tell each other how wonderful they are as they dilute our culture. But we, the rest of us, have to live with this and we have to be concerned about all of this. Nine minutes now after eight o'clock. Now, Mike Crapo didn't just come up with that two days ago. He's felt this way for a while. Governor Otter has felt this way for a while. The problem is, is that we have no serious control over this, but maybe if the U.S. Senate it probably won't happen until after Election Day. They're all busy with that, or at least a third of your senators are. But we need people in government to start pushing it back against this program. And if Hillary Clinton is elected president, remember, she'd like to bring one million more of these people into this country. She had an editorial in the Deseret News out of Salt Lake City. She was fishing for votes among Mormons because, well, we learned in Utah and Idaho, Donald Trump performs poorly in that category of voter. So she was trying to say, Trump's being mean to Muslims. People were mean to you in the past. Therefore, I'll be nice to Muslims. You should vote for me. Well, I think anybody out there who's a member of the LDS Church knows, if it came down to a battle of, are we going to have a mosque on this corner or a church on this corner, uh, they'll burn your church down to build their mosque. I'm saying it's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Not next year. But we're starting to see these issues in Europe, and it's already happening in other parts of the world where Muslims are dominant. So she thinks somehow that the, the, the Mormons in this country are going to go, oh, you're right. Those poor, uh, morally degenerate Muslims. <laughs> Just making that one up as I go along. We don't know that they all are. I think some of them actually have better morals than we do because... Hillary Clinton is pro-choice, and your average Muslim voter is pro-life, and likely most of your Muslim voters are pro-life, and guess what? So are most of your Mormon voters. So much for Hillary Clinton's attempt. 11 minutes now after 8 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 56. Now, does that mean that in these teeming refugee camps, if the German intelligence apparatus is already saying, look, we know that there are hit squads and violent extremists and cells that are working out of these camps and coming to the Western world. Does that mean that we could see some of them? And again, what gets me about all of your smarmy liberals, after you have a shooting at a movie theater or in a church or at a school and they want to take your guns away, they always argue, mm, one death is too many. But when it comes to the sexual assaults of children or handicapped women 
or the the the, the attacks on men on uh, I was downtown here a couple of weeks ago where that Eritrean said he wanted a $100 million bail, and the judge thankfully obliged him. When it comes to those things, then that's okay. Those are acceptable losses. Again, one school shooting is one too many, but if your daughter is attacked by some of these people or your your sister is attacked by some of these people or somebody else you know is stabbed or shot by one of these guys, well, that's acceptable because we wouldn't want to hurt the feelings of the rest of them because they're not all that way. Yes, but it's again, you, you, you are just increasing your odds of trouble. Only if one out of a hundred is a psychopath, you're bringing a psychopath into the community. You don't seem to get that. Why is that? Why cannot you make that connection between the life of someone in a school shooting versus the life of someone on the streets here? Are you that twisted? Or are you making so much money off your rental properties for these people? Do you realize how many of these kids got their back-to-school supplies for free on your tax time through the the refugee center? Meanwhile, you're struggling to get these things for your own children? I'm telling you right now, the global elites, and it spreads all the way down from the top, all the way into local government as well, they don't get it. Or they're making so much money off this windfall or getting reelected by saying, hey, here I am turning a shovel at a yogurt plant. I brought jobs here. Vote for me. Well, yeah, but you didn't bring many for the local people. You brought them for all of these people who are being brought here to fill those jobs. Well, that's a racist statement on your part. How dare you? Mm, Well, I'm glad that uh, I'm not a racist like you are. Vote for me. Peggy Noonan, the great writer for the Wall Street Journal, used to be, as I've mentioned in the past, a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan. She wrote those fine words after the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Her column today at the Wall Street Journal, How Global Elites Forsake Their Countrymen. And uh, then there's a picture here to illustrate this of Hillary Clinton's twin. That would be German Chancellor Angela Merkel. She's also wearing a tent. Uh, She's uh, the, the illustration here. Noonan writes, this is about distance and detachment and a kind of historic decoupling between the top and the bottom in the West that did not, in more moderate recent times, exist. And she said she was recently talking to an acquaintance of Merkel, and they got down and dirty in their conversation about how Merkel has really ruined her country and just keeps telling people and doubling down, saying we're going to bring more of these folks here. I'm going to jump a few paragraphs down. Noonan writes, Ms. Merkel had put the entire burden of a huge cultural change not on herself and those like her, but on regular people who live closer to the edge, who do not have the resources to meet the burden, who have no particular protection or money or connections. Ms. Merkel, her cabinet and government, the media and cultural apparatus that lauded her decision were not in the least affected by it and likely never would be. In other words, The elites don't have to live next door to a tribe of illegal immigrants, migrants, or refugees. Nothing in their lives, she writes, will get worse, speaking of the elites. The powerful show no particular sign of worrying about any of this. When the working and middle class pushed back in shocked indignation, the people on top called them xenophobic, narrow-minded, racist. The detached who made the decisions and bore none of the cost got to be called humanist, compassionate, and hero of human rights. And then she goes into the sexual assaults in Germany, the mass sexual assaults that have taken place and all sorts of other crimes in German cities, where, of course, the poor have to deal with it, but not the political elite. The larger point, Noonan writes, is that this is something we are seeing all over, the top detaching itself from the bottom. At its heart, it is not only a detachment from, but a lack of interest in the lives of your countrymen, of those who are not at the table, and who understand that they've been abandoned by their leader's selfishness at mad virtue signaling. And she's also writing this, in Silicon Valley, the idea of national interest is not much discussed. They'd like to see a global government. In Hollywood, the wealthy protect their own children from cultural decay, from the sick images they create for all the screens, but they don't mind if people in the inner city see all of this. This week, the Daily Caller's Peter Hassan, she writes, reported that recent Syrian refugees being resettled in Virginia were sent to the state's poorest communities, hours away from the wealthy suburbs outside of Washington, D.C. Some of the detachment isn't unconscious. Some of it is sheer and clever self-protection. At least on some level, they can take care of their own. Now, I didn't even mention the the, the sub-headline with this. That's what originally caught my mind this morning. 
The subheadline was this. Those in power see people at the bottom as aliens whose bizarre emotions they must try to manage. That's her subheadline. In other words, you're just a bunch of dumb, dumb dummies. You're cattle. You don't know what's good for you. Your elites who run the United Nations or who run your federal governments, or in many cases, people you have working in state governments or even in local city governments, believe that they know best. You don't, so they have to manage the rabble. I remember watching that movie. I think I've cited it many times on air. When the remake was done of the movie Time Machine, a lot of these remakes are terrible. Let me tell you, the remake was better than the original. But it was frightening. I mean, scary frightening. But my daughter said, you've got to see this movie. So I sat down and I watched it. And, you know, chattering as an old man, uh, you know, my, my teeth just chattering away and my skin crawling as I watched it because it was so frightening. But there's a moment where the hero, the time traveler, meets the man who has the mind control over the Morlocks. The Morlocks are the descendants of human beings who are now more like dogs, who are eating human beings. And he says to the, to, the, to the time traveler, I have to control their minds. I have to control their minds because if I didn't, they would exhaust the food supply. In other words, he controls them so he can spread out their eating of the regular human beings who are still left on the planet. Because, of course, they're just dumb, dumb dummies, dumb animals who are eating all of these human beings. And if you left them to their own devices, they would go out there and just gobble up everybody and then they wouldn't have anything left to eat. Our founding fathers didn't see the world that way. They believed that all men were capable of holding their own virtue. And even if you made mistakes, even if you drank too much rum or you fell into debt, well, we had to let everybody make these choices in their own lives. We couldn't control them. The idea was that nobody out there was any smarter than anyone else. King George III wasn't smarter than the guy who was stacking boxes on a wharf in Boston or Charleston. This was what the whole Age of Enlightenment was about. And now you've got people in government, not just internationally and nationally, but locally as well, who believe they're somehow smarter than all of you. I know a lot of these people in local government. Some of them are impressive in certain areas of their lives. But I'm going to tell you right now, if I had to sit down in an intellectual match with most of them, I don't think they're going to best me. And I don't think they're going to best most of you. And I think they're also aware of that when they're not patting themselves on their own backs, telling each other how great they happen to be, when they say, we aren't those kind of people or that kind of people. Don't speak for me. 20 minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. Your phone call's coming up following the break. It's 58 on KLIX. And I mentioned we'll take some of your telephone calls. I know it's Friday and a lot of you people are probably off to the... Uh, Free breakfast somewhere. No, 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 wait a minute. This is a conservative show. I forgot. Oh, sorry. Well, if you were listening to public radio, you might be. 824, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News 1310.com. Telephone number. If you'd like to reach our program, 736 0300. Here's a question for you What's it going to take to finally open the eyes of all of these elitists and get them to realize the potential of the threat? Uh, if what would they have to lose their rental properties? Would that do it? Uh, in other words, your tax dollars would no longer fund uh, their enrichment. I don't know. There's a question for you. You can also email me at bill.colley at townsquaremedia dot com. Also wanted to point out next Wednesday morning we're going to be joined by one of the medical pros from Trip Family Medicine here in Twin Falls, Idaho. We do it every Friday morning, Wednesday morning, excuse me, every Wednesday morning between eight thirty and nine o'clock do want to point out that Dr. Tripp's office is still looking for new patients, and they can often see you on the very same day. Generally, we'll see you on the very same day if you've got a medical issue. We want to point out that the office is located on Fillmore Street on the north side, directly across from the main post office in Twin Falls. Caller joins us at 825. Caller, you're up on, on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story. Yeah, good morning, Bill. Well, you know, Islam's battle cry has, has been death to America and Israel, and of course, the whole deal is that the fundamentalists, they're not extremists, the fundamentalists that follow the Koran are commanded in over 100 verses 
to kill infidels and those that will not convert to to Islam. And uh, it's right in the Quran. And folks, we better be starting to do what Bill is saying here. We got to wake up. But there was a book called Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley. He, uh, Bill Clinton's mentor at uh, Georgetown University. He pretty well pointed out the elite's goal is this global plantation and uh, to basically destroy society in the process of um, making us all uh, a global plantation and that they would be the rulers under the United Nations, of course, and the rest of us would be the, the, the peons and the slaves out here working for their benefit. So this has been going on for 1,400 years, and we better wake up if history repeats itself. And if we don't learn from it, we're in big, big trouble. But, but, uh, but here's the thing. You know, these, these elitists, if, if it's true that they're looking to, you know, extend this control and have a global government, then they're going to unleash a lot of forces they may not be able to control. You may remember it was the German industrialists who thought we can control this guy Hitler and we'll get what we want out of him. It didn't turn out that way, and uh, they discovered very quickly they had no control over him. And, and I would think that these elitists might look at the history of this planet and say, you know what, if we unleash these forces, it could cost us dearly too. Oh, absolutely. And Carol Quigley, before he died, uh, like say he had access to all of the elitist records of the Council on Foreign Relations and other groups, and and uh, but he could see that this was not going to work. But you're absolutely right. Um, the Islam theology, or I should say theocracy, it's, you know, I keep reading letters and so forth that we've got to be benevolent to the, their religion. It's a religion hiding behind the, you know, it's a, I should, should you know, turn it around. It's a theocracy. It's a, a goal of world political de- domination hiding behind the facade of a religion. It's not truly a religion. It's a political movement. And that's what we need to get through to people and our elected people and these people that are just getting wealthy off of the program right now, that their goal and their, this caliphate that's taking place, and of course it's just been revealed, and you probably read this too, that most of the, the migrants that are coming into Europe and especially into Germany are military-age men. They're yes. not bringing families in. Right. And they're, they're, they're coming many of them. And thank you for the call. They're coming with their cell phones and, and, uh, and expensive sneakers and everything else they have. These are not poor folks looking for uh, you know a better life from the uh, generous north. You're up next. We've got about a minute and a half before the break. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not worried at all about having these refugees come in. In fact, I think I might rent a spare bedroom out because, according to John Kerry, my biggest uh, thing I've got to worry about is my refrigerator, my air conditioner. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I guess I'm going to just kind of sit in the kitchen with my rifle and keep an eye on it. So thank yeah. you. Those appliances can be deadly. You never know. You're going to walk into the kitchen some morning, as John Kerry warned. Uh, your air conditioner is also violent, too. But if you walk into the kitchen someday, uh, you may end up walking past that refrigerator and it may fall on you because it's been plotting against you for a long time. And the air conditioner, you're outside working around that unit. You never know. It could rise up and, and slew you right on the spot. Is that slay you, I guess? Slew would be a different. Uh, uh, you were talking tense, past tense, or the like. Uh, coming up on 829, almost 830, Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning. On News Radio 1310, John Kerry, yes. Uh, Oh, as I was telling my wife the other day while we were abusing our servants after they burned the beans almondine, that there are far worse things around the world than Muslims who say they'd like to kill all of us. I know for a fact that the dishwasher has been eyeing me for a very long time, and Donald Trump has been encouraging the dishwasher to come and get all of we liberals. Got more coming up in just a few minutes. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Caller Adrian a couple of minutes ago referenced how they're trying to break down culture. Boy, do I have a, a clipping here that you've got to hear. It's from my old coworker, Matt Walsh, who now writes for The Blaze. Details on that coming up. Many years ago, I guess it's not too many years ago, it, it probably would be four or five years ago, I worked with a very bright young man. He was only about. 24, 25 years old at the time. I, I was the host of an afternoon drive radio program, and I would wrap up after my show, and he was on the air for the three hours after me. 
I didn't get to know him really well. His name was Matt Walsh because Matt would come in and do his show prep and everything else while I was on the air. But, you know, we'd get to pass in the studio for a couple of minutes and share some thoughts. And we had uh, a lot of similarities. He, I was I was the reformed libertarian. He was more libertarian at the time than I am. But he's not one of these, uh, you know, dope-smoking libertarians because he's a very strict, I mean, very traditional Roman Catholic, and he doesn't get involved with those things. I've said it before that once the Libertarian is a party, well, that's the capital L Libertarians, once they became just nothing but the dope-smoking party, a lot of us abandoned them. But Matt has since started a family and uh, raising a large family, and he was a super, super guy on the air, and he was fearless, absolutely fearless. Unfortunately, we had an advertiser who was in collusion with a lot of your local Democrat Party politicians and a lot of the, we had a large homosexual community where we were working, and a lot of them were very liberal, and they didn't like Matt's overt conservative Catholicism on the air. And I never knew this. He ended up leaving the radio station, and then shortly thereafter, I heard he found a job working in radio in Louisville. And then within a couple of years, he was working for Glenn Beck's The Blaze, and now Matt is one of the best-known conservative columnists in all of America. Why do I cite all of this? Was, I think about a year ago, I was talking to our former program director, and he fessed up and admitted that Matt had been fired because the liberal advertiser and other liberals in the community had pressured the company to get rid of Matt. Now, if it had just been liberals, it would have been you know ignored, but it was a liberal advertiser as well, and the company folded on the spot and decided to dump Matt overboard. Matt has a post today at the, uh, at the Blaze, if all love is equal, this incestuous mother and son couple should be celebrated. And he says, another dispatch from Sodom, the Daily Mail reports on the controversial romance of a New Mexico couple who reconnected after many years apart and fell instantly in love upon meeting again. It would be like something right out of a fairy tale if not for the fact that the two lovebirds are related. Not just related, but mother and son. I'm going to jump ahead. I've, I've printed the whole thing out, but I wanted to get to a couple of points he was making here that I think we should hear, because he mentions this all started with uh, same-sex couples. You know, first it was the uh, the homosexuals saying, we need to have the uh, same rights as everybody else, which they did, but, you know, they... See, we could have called, we could have changed the name marriage to blue, and then they all would have wanted to be blue. Then we could have changed the uh, name of uh, blue to horse feathers, and then they all would have wanted to be horse feathers. You know how that goes. But he, he's saying that that opened the door to all of these other strange strange relationships. If you accept the progressive premise, he writes, in the former case, you cannot suddenly abandon it in the latter. It makes no sense. You're being intellectually dishonest, and you know it. Of course, he says, these are not the only rationales offered for gay marriage. There are others. And then he lists these. One, I was born this way. Two, I can't choose who I love. Three, it's 2016. Four, I have a right to be happy. Five, I should have the same right as people who do not share my proclivity. Six, this kind of sexuality exists in the animal kingdom. Seven, don't be narrow-minded. Eight, stop judging. Number nine, stop imposing your religious beliefs on me. And so on. Under each argument, right down the line without exception, he says this woman Monica and her son Caleb qualify, as do folks in the bestiality and pedophile and polygamous communities. A slippery slope, he writes. No, there is no slope. It's a straight plunge into the abyss. Traditional marriage, he writes, was a separate and distinct thing and could be justified using arguments that don't apply to anything but itself. It existed on hard ground and was built on a solid foundation with walls and a roof and everything else. Once you tear all of that down and dig out the ground from underneath it, the descent into utter madness and depravity is inevitable, he writes, sudden and unstoppable. Progressives spent decades calling the slippery slope, ar slope argument against gay marriage a fallacy, so they are now reluctant to admit that everything conservatives said in that regard was plainly true and will soon come to fruition. Get a chance. Check that out at The Blaze. His name is Matt Waltz, uh, Walsh, and I think you'll, uh, you'll enjoy the read. And then this morning I read in The Washington Times where this latest thing to get uh, the, you know, the, the, the men who like to wear dresses to allow them to pee in public bathrooms and go into the locker rooms with your little girls, is being funded by George Soros. George Soros was a man as a teenager who helped the Nazis gas his own people. Folks, he is celebrated by the American left. 
Uh, they, they, they think he's a great guy. Oh, well, you know, he was for, he had no choice in gassing his own people. Uh, that's his story. Have you ever investigated it? No, we don't investigate the claims of our fellow travelers, only those Republicans we don't like. We've got to take a short break. Look, I'll take your phone calls on any topic this morning. It's Friday, and I think we can open it up. But I do have to get to the break coming up. I don't have any control over that. But please feel free to chime in following it. We have some great sponsors who bring you some great messages every morning right here on News Radio 1310. KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Got a new one joining me next Friday. If I get a chance, I'll give you a preview of that a little later in the show. Because on Fridays, we're going to start dedicating a portion of the program to the Second Amendment to firearms, to training, and the like. And I think that it's going to be uh, something that is, well, at least in the eyes of this audience, an important segment that we do every week. Details on that coming up at least sometime in the next few days. Right now, it's 58 at KLIX, 20 minutes from 9 o'clock.